I'm really pleased to be joined by uh, Mark Miller, who's a Foresight Fellow as well, um, a Foresight Senior Fellow, and um, we've written um, a paper together. I, I would love to ask you, could you maybe describe your background in, in a sentence or two and how it relates to this topic, just that you know, people have an idea of like, why are we talking about this topic? <laughs> Early on in my career, I started off with um, uh, two interests that I thought of as very, very different interests. Uh, on the one hand, I was fascinated by uh, software, and in particular, uh, the uh, practice of object-oriented programming and software architecture uh, in terms of dividing up the responsibility of a large program into little objects talking to each other. Um, on the other hand, I was also uh, fascinated by economics. Due to the, the uh, insights of several uh, brilliant friends of mine, um, I came to realize that both systems are networks of, in, in, in my modern uh, way of explaining it, are systems of networks of entities making requests of other entities. Uh, and that both of them bring about very similar approaches to the knowledge problem. That the problem solving ability of the entire network of entities making requests of each other is a problem-solving ability that is way in excess, that takes more knowledge into account than the knowledge that can be fit into any one of those entities. And that the miracle of these architectures of request making is that they successfully compose these dis disparate components of knowledge together into an overall greater effect. From that, I... Um, uh, was thinking about this vision of decentralized computational markets as this decentralized cryptographic um, uh, so software-based uh, means of cooperation that would also make the human world more cooperative by being embedded in the human world. Uh, Eric Drexler and I wrote a set of papers in 1988 called the Agoracopen Systems Papers. Um, a I'm link a, from them from, from existentialhope.com in case you're interested. And um, uh, the and at the time that, that I wrote the papers, I imagined that the world was going to give me the underlying distributed secure fabric of uh, where objects could, could interact only voluntarily through comp secure computer architecture because clearly it made sense, so clearly the world was going to build this. Uh, the world didn't build it, um, uh, so I got fascinated with computer security, ended up um, founding, um, switching between startup companies and uh, research labs, large corporations. Uh, tomorrow's my last day at Google. I leave to form a new startup company named Agoric. That is... Thank you. Um, uh, which is, uh, again, pursuing that original vision of decentralized computational markets on a secure substrate, um, but now doing it um, uh, in the context of this now emerging new sector of the economy, the, the, the one often identified as blockchain, or I think the right terminology is crypto commerce. But there's now this large emerging sector so for all these ideas that I've been working on since 88, um, I can say it's finally not too early. Yeah, it was interesting at an uh, event that we had on object-based um, capabilities with um, Zuko um, from Zcash, with Arthur Brightman from, uh, from Tezos with Mark, and with a couple of others. Mark afterwards came to me and was like, suddenly people care and are interested in this, you know, yeah. like, and those ideas have literally been around, um, well, for more than 20 years, right? And, and it's interesting to see that now it just has a different label on top. Um, but, but we get into that um, later in the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe to set the stage, um, because I've been banging on, on about civilizations as superintelligence, and we co-authored this, co this paper on that for the UCLA Risk Colloquium last year. 
um, that proposes decentralized approaches to reducing existential risk, especially arising from AI and um, cybersecurity, but also nano and biotech. So in terms of on the AI focus and cybersecurity isn't part of this, but um, we basically propose that, you know, um, while traditional AI safety approaches seek to create this novel non-human entity and then try to align it with human inter interests, instead what we should consider is civilization as super intelligence because it is already super intelligent and aligned with our interests. Could you elaborate on this, especially why civilization is super intelligent and why it is aligned with our interests? Yeah. Could you bring up that graphic? I will. Okay. So, civilization as a whole uh, is sort of the, the ultimate existing network of entities making requests of other entities. Of course, there's many interactions other than the voluntary uh, making of requests and responding to them. Um, but uh, as Steven Pinker in The Better Angels of Our Nature uh, makes very clear, the degree of violent interactions has been plummeting to a degree that's, that's I think, even for him, very hard to explain. Uh, but it has been plummeting. Uh, and in a network of, um, in a network of interactions that are dominated by voluntary interactions, the entities interacting with each other generally choose to interact um, uh, when they expect mutual benefit. Um, and th this to a first approximation, first approximation, I'll come back to it, to a first approximation leads the system as a whole to climb Pareto preferred hills. Uh, let me explain what that means. Um, uh, Pareto preferred is a um, uh, concept from The Economist, uh, uh, Wilfred Pareto? Well, Pareto, that hypothetical world A is Pareto preferred to hypothetical world B if A, in A, at least one person is better off and no one is worse off. In a system dominated by um, voluntary interactions, where the interactions are generally engaged in, in expectation of mutual benefit, the emergent property of the system uh, to a first approximation should lead to the climbing of Pareto preferred hills. Why is this relevant? So civilization as a whole is not a thing in the sense of an agent. It's not an agent you can make requests of. It's not a thing with interests. It has no consciousness. It does not suffer or not suffer. It has no utility or utility function. But it does have a dynamic. It climbs a tropism in the same way that a plant has a phototropism or a geotropism climbing towards the sun or away from gravity. Uh, the overall dynamic of civilization driven by the fact that it's emergent from, from mostly voluntary interactions has been to, has been a dynamic that overall has been extremely, extraordinarily well aligned with human interests. I want everyone to really take a look at this graph and think about what these numbers mean, what this graph means in terms of actual human lives and human suffering and human benefit. Um, on the left, we have 1920. On the right, we have 2015. The overall graph is the increase in population. The red is the number of people living in extreme poverty. The green is the number of people not living in extreme poverty. Even at the beginning of the graph, the number of people not living in extreme poverty was going up much faster than the people living in extreme poverty, but as the overall population was rising, both of them were rising in absolute numbers. Lately, the, number, the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty has been suddenly plunging, and it's been plunging while the population has been zooming up. So this is a tremendous improvement in the world. Uh, as Steven Pinker says, we've been doing something right 
it would be good to know what it is. So, now let's talk about uh, AI safety, and I'm going to start with a, a, a um, little quote from Karl Popper. Uh, Karl Popper saying, um, for most of the history of political science, the central question was, who should rule? You know, who is it that properly has the design, divine right of kings or whatever it is? Who should the dictator be? And it took us a long time to realize that's the wrong question, to unask the question and instead um, ask the question that, that James Madison asked. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If men were ruled by angels, angels um, uh, then I forget the exact words, but basically we, we wouldn't be worried about what the structure of government was. There's no danger here. Think about the position that the Founding Fathers were in. They knew that there was going to be a government, that there were going to be large special interests lobbying the government. These are large super intelligences that would last, that would outlive them, and they were not trying to optimize. They were not trying to create a dynamic such that some optimal would be reached, some utopia. They were trying to depessimize. They were terrified of the dangers, and to deal with the dangers, they created a, a, a system in which multiple superintelligences coexisted and were put in opposition to each other. They built a system which was internally conflicted by design. The phrases that I want to introduce are um, decentralization, polycentrism, pluralism, and diversity. That uh, right now our civilization uh, is, is emergent from a mixture of human intelligences and machine intelligence. Machine, the participation of machine, machine intelligences is already quite significant in the overall intelligence of civilization. And civilization's problem-solving abilities uh, through coordination through the net, through all sorts of things that have been happening recently, has been um, growing exponentially at quite a fast rate. So it meets a lot of the criteria of the superintelligences that we're supposed to be scared of. However, uh, in the soft takeoff scenario, to use Nick Bostrom's terminology, uh, uh, this gradual increase of many different machine intelligences that are knit into the overall fabric of voluntary interaction um, uh, and, and growing with regard to how much of the aggregate intelligence they're contributing to, remains a diverse world in which both the humans and machines are serving a great variety of goals. That's the key thing, is this tremendous variety of separate goals rather than trying to agree on some overall goals. And one of the ways to think about why the world has become so peaceful is that the systems of rules, the systems of governments, uh, of governance that we we're all engaged in is in some sense the outcome of the constant renegotiation that all of these interests have with each other so that each one can better serve its own interests while embedded in a system of other things serving their interests. And that statement is not in any sense specific to people being the interest-bearing entities. So if we, if in making this transition to a world dominated by machine intelligences, we have a highly diverse, pluralistic, decentralized world uh, where, where many, many different interests are being pursued, and starting off seated in a world of voluntary interactions, then I'm hopeful the way James Madison was hopeful and turned out to be, you know, in that case to be right, doesn't mean that I'm right, but I'm hopeful 
that that's the right way to get things pointed so that it continues to be a system that serves the goals of all of the participating goal-bearing entities uh, in, uh, in voluntary cooperative interaction with each other. So kind of to paraphrase this, and maybe um, it's helpful if I bring up the initial uh, graph that I made uh, here. So um, to distinguish this kind of approach from um, the approach to um, artificial general intelligence that was brought he forth here in terms of corporations is that we do agree that corporations can also be classified as not only general intelligences but also super intelligences. The same holds for teams, nations and tribes. Um, the difference being that um, that in terms of corporations or in terms of civilization, civilization is just simply the bigger system because it entails corporations, teams, nations, and, tri and tribes. So it should be the relevant system that sh we should be looking at. Um, and the difference is also here that, um, or at least to me, um, that civilization is enabling interactions between uh, voluntary uh, cons constituents, which are humans, which then tend to climb parade preferred paths, while corporations serve their own constituents fairly well by maximizing profit, perhaps, but, you know, just not the larger, um, kind of like the rest of humanity, which is what we're ultimately concerned about um, in terms of well-being, right? So I think uh, maybe just to say a few words about why this is not a totally inclusive definition and, uh, and we just have to accept everything as intelligent. Why um, do you think that it would just, for example, not be um, sensible to talk about the biosphere in, in, a, in a sense that it's intelligent that would be useful to add to the conversation? So where do, you, where do we draw the line and why? And this okay. could be very brief so we can yeah. move on. So first of all, um, uh, when I try to explain that sort of the larger thing is more intelligent than all the pieces, um, uh, because it includes the pieces. Um, uh, let me admit that in some ways there's a terminological sleight of hand going on because the pieces are included, so how can the whole be less intelligent? Um, but in fact, we see uh, um, public choice pathologies all the time. And this is where, I this is the reason why I kept emphasizing first approximation. Uh, there's all sorts of group action dilemmas where individually intelligent things composed together can create pathologies in the large that none of the in, that each of the individuals individually would not have gone down you know made those particular mistakes what i mean when i say that civilization as a whole is super intelligent part of it is that we have found the means to cooperate, to mostly cooperate with each other, and by cooperating, bring together more knowledge in, for the sake of problem solving than any of us know individually. Now, I won't deny that a, the biosphere is intelligent, that it is a problem solving system. I think that it absolutely is. The things that we're doing that are destructive of the biosphere are definitely some things that we should worry about. But with regard to the, the kinds of um, worry that meetings like this are about, the kind of problem solving ability that the biosphere has left to its own devices are not going to cause our extinction. The, the, you know, the, the, the ant colony is not about to have an AI breakthrough that destroys us. Um, so on the one hand, um, it's not part of the danger issue. And then on the other hand, uh, the speed with which the biosphere grows in its inherent problem-solving ability um, is of a time scale much longer than the time scales at which we're worried. All right, so if we kind of like for now accept um, for the sake of argument that civilization actually is in fact the relevant super intelligence, once because it is the one that is kind of almost like Occam's razor, like the one that is the main relevant super intelligence in the sense that it contains all relevant intelligences while... Um, but but it's not just that it contains, it contains them composed together in a system that succeeds at bringing their knowledge together cooperatively. Yeah, we talked about it yesterday in the kind of analogy of a brain. If civilization solves a problem, 
um, it, it still requires its constituent to solve the problem, but it has also the mechanism to find those constituents that should be solving those problems. Um, and, and in so far, it's also that mechanism by, by which to find them, which is the market mechanism. Um, but if we for now kind of accept this kind of like more broader definition of intelligence, um, let's get to the one on how is it actually beneficial, how is it that it climbs Pareto preferred paths, because this is something sorry, how is it the what? that it climbs Pareto preferred paths, or how okay. is it that the tropism that it okay. exhibits um, climbs Pareto preferred paths, because it does seem that, um, or at least in, in, in Peter has written a kind of like an, um, um, an answer to our paper um, that it does seem right now that um, civilization might not be set up um, perfectly. And Eliezer Yukowski wrote a similar book um, on um, how civilizations get, get stuck that came out recently that talks about that there's so many social coordination problems and it's really hard to solve them mm -hmm. and because they require collective action phenomena. Okay. So first of all, like, how do you think we could solve those institutional um, barriers? But then also, there's many individual things that are going wrong right now um, in terms of cybersecurity, which is one thing that you're very worried about. So how yeah. does that fit in with the civilization as a whole being set up for good? I'm going to start with the cybersecurity. Um, uh, when I talk to people concerned with AI dangers and I ask them concretely, what are you worried about? If you've got this monster AI that's taking over and is going to you know, build paper clips or become Skynet or whatever it is, how does it start? What is the first step of the disaster? And almost always, not always, almost always, the answer begins with what we would normally describe as cyber war. Uh, the answer begins with it gets into the network. It, it, it escapes whatever kind of you know, confinement box we were trying to keep it into. It, it starts deploying all of these computer systems we have all over, all over the world for its own purposes instead of our purposes. Right? I mean, the thing is, if, this, if, the, if the AI in question were governed by our laws, it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter if it wants to turn the world into paper clips. It doesn't own the world. It doesn't have a right to eat me and turn me into paper clips because I'm not its property. Uh, in order for this disaster scenario to happen, it has to escape whatever law-like constraints we're trying to impose on it. Um, uh, so uh, so they, they begin that way. And then I say, okay, in order for that attack to happen, what level of intelligence does it need? It doesn't need general intelligence. It doesn't need to be able to seem like a human. It doesn't have to be able to engage in conversation. Um, it, it, um, what does it need to be able to do in order to succeed at that cyber attack? And the answer is everything that is enabling of the disaster scenario is a level of AI and other software techniques that are already behind us. We are already over the, the AI threshold that endangers our civilization. Our civilization rests on the infrastructure that my industry has created. The pervasive insecurability of that infrastructure puts civilization in danger. We've survived till now because the ability to invent attacks, to discover the attacks and then mount them, um, the discovery of the vulnerabilities, the creation of the attacks have largely been humans with human bottlenecks where the computers were only deploying attacks designed by humans. The DARPA Grand Challenge has already demonstrated that you bring um, modern machine learning together with static analysis, you can build a cell, an adaptive pathogen that goes out there and invents attacks on the fly. Um, and it, and um, the DARPA Grand Challenge was won by a small group. Imagine if a large group mounted that attack, or anything a large group can do today, the natural progress of our technology means a small group can do it tomorrow. So we're past the threshold. Any world safe against AI is a world that's already safe against cyber war. 
Uh, and becoming safe against cyber war, starting from the current situation, is extremely hard, but there's no other path to safety other than going through it. All right. So if this is kind of like the main problem that we should be worrying about, and I touched on this in the introduction talk as well, where I go through the four different problem domains of ethics and technical alignment and cybersecurity and social coordination, because cybersecurity does still seem to be one that is very neglected right now. Um, and I know I only know of like two papers that actually take that ser issue seriously in relation to AI. But what would be proposals to overcome this? What what, what could we be doing right now? Okay. Um, uh, so uh, several things. Um, the first thing is um, the simple fact that most people don't know, including most technical people, most software people, and even from what I've seen, I would say most people who specialize in computer security, is that secure computing is both possible and practical. Most people have written it off as you can't make computers secure, um, uh, and therefore all we can do is manage the continuing insecurity. And all of our techniques of management assume a economics of attack that's about to be overthrown by automated attack software. I would point in particular to the SEL4 operating system. Um, uh, this was done by, originally by the Australian military. DARPA has invested heavily into it. They have a machine-checked proof of correctness and security of the actual implementation, not of a model of the implementation, but of the actual co machine code. Um, it's the first time that's ever been done with a system that's a high-performance practical system like this. Um, and then DARPA then mounted a very, very intense red teaming attack on it, and it was the first system that survived DARPA's best red team as an, uh, as an attack exercise. The, the first one is literally proof. But neither one of these is a guarantee of safety. A proof is only a proof with regard to a, speci a formal specification. It's very easy to misunderstand what the specification means. The nice thing about this is that these are two very cross-cutting forms of evidence uh, that have very different comparative strengths and weaknesses. And for it to withstand both is very strong evidence that there's something good there. So that's on the one hand. Um, however, the hard problem is not building the underlying foundations for secure computing. The hard problem is adoption. And here's where I'm, again, very impressed with the world of blockchain. In the world of blockchain, when somebody deploys a smart contract, like on Ethereum, that has a vulnerability, Hundreds of millions of dollars disappear overnight, and there's no recourse. It's a, what did Chris Miller, uh, Chris Allen call it? Uh, yeah. One million dollar bug bounty, or hundred million dollar bug bounty. Right, right. There's these huge bug bounties, effectively. And when one of these things gets collected, the software with the vulnerability dies. Now, I'm no fan of people losing hundreds of millions of dollars with no recourse, but the dynamic that creates is that you have an ecosystem of software that's just starting out, it's in its infancy, but there's an ecosystem of software in which the dynamic is that things with vulnerabilities die an early death so that the, the ecosystem comes to be populated by the survivors of that process. And that potentially leads to the ability to grow a more overall robust stack, all the way from the foundations to the user, a more robust overall software stack than the world has ever been able to afford to build before. And then hopefully perform a genetic takeover on the current system that is insecurable. Um, and that is definitely a technological part um, of the matter. But it, it, I mean, we, we mentioned the Hobbesian trap as well in our paper. So, what other other things in terms of like education or you know in terms of like government education do you think need to be done? I'm there? Sorry, in terms of in terms of education, education need to be done there because the adoption barriers are high, mm -hmm. first of all, and then also second of all, um, it just doesn't seem that without a pressing incentive, um, 
you know, or without kind of an educating entity, and yeah. you know, we might be able to take that on at Foresight, some, a lot would be coming from it. Okay, so one question that has come up repeatedly is, uh, what good could the government do? And I'll just admit right out um, that I am much more of a skeptic uh, on, go on government action being able to actually do more good than harm, but that doesn't mean it's, worth, it's not worth looking. Um, uh, so here's one thing that, that I believe might be a realistic thing to ask, in particular, the U.S. government to do, where it's conceivable to me that it's polit politically realistic that this might actually happen. Uh, Richard Clark, who comes from the uh, sort of governmental establishment national security uh, world, uh, makes the point that the U.S. Is, is, is much more dependent on cyber infrastructure than many of our adversaries, uh, that the ability to attack is already a saturated ability, the degree of destruction you can engage in, and therefore further investment in attack does us no marginal good on safety. Um, uh, further investment on defense does. Now, where he goes from that point, that perfectly valid point, the policy recommendations he makes, I think are, let's just say I disagree with them completely, but let's take the premise there. The NSA has been the best pen testing team, penetration testing team, that the world has ever seen. They're really, really very good at finding exploitable vulnerabilities and building exploits that make use of them. They have this tremendously valuable stockpile of um, such things, and we know from the, the, the uh, release through the adversarial release through the shadow brokers and the resulting cyber attacks that happened, that just taking a small part of that stockpile and releasing it uh, leads to a tremendous ability to attack. Um, now, uh, there's this practice in software security called responsible disclosure. So if company A, let's say, finds that the software from company B has a vulnerability, um, uh, a dynamic that has emerged as a norm, Google in particular has advocated this and practices it, is that you first, A, informs B privately, secretly, says, look, there's this vulnerability, but also company A judges what's a reasonable time frame to wait for company B to fix the vulnerability and deploy the fix, and then based on that judgment, states a deadline, says, after this amount of time, we're going to release this vulnerability to the public whether you have fixed it or not. And long experience with responsible disclosure says it's only the threat of the general release to the public with the deadline that causes these vulnerabilities to get fixed. So uh, the, the ask, the governmental policy, could be something al along the lines of um, uh, any discovered vulnerability after a 10-year shelf life has to get responsibly disclosed to the parties responsible for the vulnerability. This gives the, the, the government 10 years of offensive explo ex exploitation. Uh, and then in 12 years, it has to be publicly released. Now, the nice thing about 10 years is it's a little bit more than two election cycles away. So the costs of this is somebody else's problem. All right, so um, this kind of like responsible um, release would be, would be definitely one thing that, that you've mentioned before in, in, in a workshop that we did on this matter, but I think generally education on this matter yeah. would be one thing that, yeah. let me, that let is me, much let me, needed. Let me mention another thing that I think is it's really important to get this across, and this is a great forum to do it. Uh, the other AI emergence scenario, the, the pictures painted by Yudkowsky and Bostrom, is the, are the fast takeoff scenarios where there's a breakthrough and there's, let's say, a, a, a chain reaction breakthrough as the thing does recursive self-improvement, and there's this sudden emergence of this thing of such great capacity that it does a strategic takeover of the world and potentially becomes the dictator forever. And I think 
Any such unitary takeover is the worst case, is the disaster that we need to avoid at all costs. Um, and the program that Yudkowsky and Bostrom recommend of let's design a utility function, or going back to Norbert Wiener, let's design a utility function so that it serves human interests. Let's be realistic about what the hard takeoff scenario looks like. There's some organization within which the hard takeoff happens. What are the chances that that organization decides to take the Yudkowsky Bostrom well-designed utility function and make that the goal structure rather than a self-serving goal structure. And even if they say they're going to take the benign goal structure, why should anybody else believe them? Now, let's back up a few days. Let's say that there's one power in the world that is, looks like it's on the edge of doing a permanent unilateral military takeover of the world. And there's nothing that they can do that will cause the other adversarial players on the world to believe them about the friendliness of the utility function it's going to install, whether or not they intend to install the friendly one. I cannot imagine a scenario that is more likely to provoke a nuclear war. Launching a nuke at the power that's about to do a unilateral military takeover that, that lasts to the end of time, uh, that is the last chance you have to prevent a takeover by people you don't necessarily trust. If the philosophers are in a position, in the position that they imagine, of being able to have enough influence to install a utility function, then any scenario in which they have that much influence is a scenario in which they can take the breakthrough technology, open source it, distribute it immediately all over the world to a zillion different players who use it to pursue a zillion different goals and try as best as we can to get to a multipolar, diverse, decentralized world where all of these things find themselves needing to cooperate with each other in order to maximally pursue their own goals, because each one individually is a small fraction of the overall world of superintelligences they find themselves in.